Today's episode is episode 220 and today's episode is called Circles of Interest. So today's episode is about following your polymath tendencies. In my life there's three main circles for me. There'd be linguistics, there'd be foreign languages, computer programming and psychology, human psychology. They would be the three circles of interest for me, three primary circles. They kind of underpin the broad areas of interest that I find myself following. So in today's episode, I'm going to look at some of the, I don't know, share some insights around that for me, something that might be useful, and then maybe look at a downside to having polymath tendencies. So I guess it all comes from being, you know, that old kind of saying of being a square peg trying to shove yourself into a round hole. That's what I feel like uh, people with polymath tendencies may feel in a in an education system that is more focused on specialization. So when you've got this passion to explore diverse area of in, areas of interest, there, there can be a feeling of being a square peg trying to fit yourself into a round hole. Actually, when I was looking into this, when I was looking into this, I think Wikipedia of all places, uh, it said that Square pegs and round holes, like he was giving literal examples of it. And they said that Dutch settlers in northeastern North America sometimes punched square cut pegs into round holes when building in the 1800s. So it is something that, that, that happens. So I just kind of thought that that was quite funny, that, that something that's kind of seen as a a metaphor or an analogy or something in our minds that like doesn't fit was actually done. It was in, implemented back then. And I'm sure there's other examples in the world today. It's how crazy the world is. So I suppose the one thing I want to start off on here is humans play a part in everything. So this is touching on the point that even though you might be finding your interests are in diverse fields, the one thing that underpins everything are human beings. We've got a hand in everything. So I suppose that's the psychology element. I've always been naturally curious about human psychology. Or maybe I wasn't in my very early years, but definitely from my early 20s onwards, I've been interested in human psychology, understanding myself better, understanding other people better. So just that interest alone will lead you into multiple different fields because I don't think a field exists where it's, well, it possibly does, but it's not common that you'll find a field that exists that's purely technical, that's cut off and isolated from all other human beings in my opinion that doesn't exist even if you're interacting with one other, one other human being then the element of human psychology is brought into the brought into focus and even within that it's communication like I, i'd be of the belief that if you focus on improving your communication skills it compensates for any for technical deficiencies so, for example, for computer programming, I think there's a certain amount of technical ability you need to have I can't that I can't fully quantify right now. But there's also a vast range in the abilities of people within the tech industry. And I feel like you could be somebody who's like an average programmer, but if you've got very good communication skills, it massively impacts the value you bring because it's easier as a team member to interact with you. You don't lose as much time either when you've got good communicators in your team because in my opinion, a good communicator is someone who is to the point that they don't waste time and talking on tangents that are unrelated to what is at hand. So that's the communication part. And then even the taking on feedback part, if you're a person who focuses on not taking feedback personally then again i think you'll take on board things quicker and you'll be easier to deal with too you can be more honest with a person like that because you can see they're not taking things to heart and they're not like the main thing is to is to focus on maintaining good relationships with people like some people are easier to get on with than others that's life. There's always going to be difficult, more difficult people. 
the more eat the more pe- people are easier to get on with but if you focus on yourself focus on those soft skills then i feel like that that'll compensate for the developer who if you have two technical people one's like excellent and the other one is very good or good i feel like the good communications or the excellent communication skills might make the good or very good developer more valuable than an excellent developer who's got no real communication skills who's inept socially and who's difficult to work with that's one thing to keep in mind from this whole episode it's the psychology part that underpins i feel the tendency to be a polymath because it's as well a large chunk of the learning here is being fascinated with your own learning style trying to think like not even trying to think of ways to improve your learning but it's bringing an awareness to how you like to learn like where what you find enjoyable working on thinking about what you find a struggle are there ways to minimize the things that you don't like doing like there's always going to be certain things you have to do but is there just thinking about those things is there ways to optimize the things i really like doing and to minimize the things i don't like doing and that's not even necessarily connected monetarily so for me i enjoy reading psychology i enjoy sharing thoughts around psychology and philosophy so i'll do that anyway i found a space i've created a space where i do it anyway regardless of any kind of monetary income or anything that comes from it it's it's just from the pure there's an enjoyment but it's also it's it's a self-actualization it's a i feel a lot of personal growth from that and that for me is is possibly even more important than any monetary thing that can come from it because if you grow as a person if you become valuable then you can acquire skills that have monetary value i think that's a better way to approach it than to look at the skill do something you might actually hate but and then you're in a cycle of just doing it for the money because that limits your potential too because if you're not really enjoying something if you're not really curious about it there's only so far your mind can go in that and uh yeah so i suppose a downside to my approach i've changed fields once in my career within the it sector i went from like desktop support into programming in order to do that i did need to take like a salary cut and you're starting to build up your expertise again and there was no guarantee it would work out either there is an element of risk there but then it's it's you also have to think about your circumstances so i was a single guy with no family to think about when i was making those decisions with no dependence financially on me so it gives you a certain amount of freedom to make those choices that's something to keep in mind for somebody in your early 20s or even in your 30s if you're single now is probably the best time to take risks if you need to take risks that's the way i kind of look at it so the next part i want to talk about is the syntax so this is what opened my eyes syntax and semantics were two of the words that opened my eyes to see that potentially there was a bridge between linguistics and computer programming because they use syntax and semantics in the same way and so as a self-directed learner syntax semantics so when you start off learning something new the syntax that's where you start you have to learn the rules you have to learn how do you formulate a sentence how do you even foreign language how do you start learning grammar so that when you're using words there there's some sort of coherence there that somebody could understand you they're not just random words that somebody has to try and decipher because most people won't do that so you need to it doesn't need to be perfect but you do need to learn grammar to the extent that it makes some it makes coherent sense to someone so the syntax semantics there you'll spend a bit of time learning that but it's important to keep in mind that their syntax and semantics in and of themselves aren't very valuable in the real world it's in the application of the syntax and semantics that you see results in the world so with the syntax of programming you could 
learn how to write a for loop, learn how to write conditional statements. But if you don't know how to solve any real world problem with that logic, then it's limited. It doesn't have any impact in the real world. And so that's something that I think I probably spent a good year or so not not fully being able to look at something and think about how think about what logic would go into creating that application so i spent a good bit of time even though i was working on building applications i spent a good bit of time just it was just repetition that's kind of how i start off in a new field just to make the barrier to entry lower for me i engage in quite a bit of mindless repetition and if possible mindless repetition where i can listen to music because that gets me to look forward to doing something so i could spend quite a bit of time that's what i did with language hacking also when i was learning spanish and italian when i'd learn words so i'd, I'd create a bit of a plan so one of my one part of my plan was to learn I think I was looking at word usage frequency and I worked out, well, I didn't work out, I just read it from, from different uh, paper, I read it from some paper that, what I don't know what the number was again, but it was something not that high. It might have been 2,000 words will get you to maybe 70 something percent fluency, conversational fluency in the language. And so when I saw that, I started trying to work out what would those words be and I started asking questions about it was a lot of it was awareness building. So I just paid attention then to what are the most frequently used words that I use day to day? What are the things I talk about day to day with people? So you have to individualize it to yourself then to understand like what are those words? Because it's not a there's no point in learning words that you're not going to use. You have to think about it in reference to your own native language. What are the words you're using? So I broke it up into nouns, adjectives, adverbs. I had a plan in place and then I would mindlessly learn it by listening to music. So there was an application called Anki, like a flashcard system. So I would just maybe spend half an hour going through that, listening to music. It was great. I used to look forward. I used to look forward to doing that purely because it was like, it was relaxing to me. And so that lowered the barrier to entry and it wasn't a struggle for me then starting off as a beginner when I was thinking of ways to make it something I would like doing. Same way of programming, I spent quite a bit of time as well just mindlessly following tutorials that I didn't really understand. But I knew that if I just immerse myself in this, then over time something will some things will start to go in. And see so you gradually get bored of a task after a while, you just move on to another thing. So everybody works at their own pace. That's what I like about self directed learning, is that you can work at your own pace. And the beauty of it too, I had a job, so I wasn't in a position where I needed to learn it quick to get a job. I already had a job. It was more something that I just felt like I like programming. I like learning this. It's challenging. And maybe one day I'll get a job from it. Even that, I didn't even know whether I get a job, but I was going to learn it anyway, because there's benefits to learning things, regardless of whether you're going to get a job or you're going to get something from it. There's it, like, it gives you insights into a field you know nothing about before so that's one of the joys of learning after it's way to really just love learning so yeah learning the syntax and semantics alone isn't enough even in foreign languages the real learning comes from speaking to people and that's this again ties into the psychology like language learning it doesn't exist in a vacuum like the whole like what got me really motivated to learn french was the idea of speaking to french people like when i was in secondary school i didn't know any french people i don't think i'd even met a french person at that stage so there wasn't as intense a motivation to want to learn it all i can remember from my teenage years was watching some late night french movies on tg Carr, uh, an irish channel and that fascinated me just seeing people talk in a different language i don't know why exactly it was french i was drawn to but uh because, yeah, the, like, the Irish language didn't fascinate me as much, t to be honest. Maybe it was because, like, a foreign country, an unknown land. I think maybe that was the element of it as well. But it was in university when I saw that, oh, you can make friends with French people. Or you can get to know French people. And you can speak to them 
through their language. Like the idea of being able to speak to somebody who I couldn't speak to if I didn't learn their language, for me that was a challenge. That was like something worthwhile doing. So this is it here. Like it's acquiring the real world experience. That's what I noticed with learning French is that there's you have to overcome self confidence issues. You have to overcome the fear of making mistakes because you will encounter people who will point it out in a kind of a mean spirited way. Uh, so you're going to encounter them. I would say 90% of the people I've met when I was learning languages were pleasant to interact with. Most people, those people, like 90% of people are, they, they can empathize. It's like, the, or even if they don't like, especially, I suppose it's the people who, so there's two different types of people from what I can see monolinguals. There's the people who are monolingual and they encounter somebody who's trying to speak their language, but it's not great. But then they appreciate that because they're like, wow, I can't even, I can't speak any other language so they can appreciate this person that they've got some bit of skill to be able to speak to me. And then there's the other person who doesn't think like that. They interact with someone they see them more as like, well, to be honest, I don't know how they see them, but the vibe they kind of give off is that they kind of can make a mockery of you because you're not communicating like a native. They have that kind of conception in their mind that you either speak properly or you don't speak at all. And that's possibly part of why they're monolingual themselves, that if you have that attitude towards other people, then from what I can see, you'll probably have that attitude towards yourself. So it'll limit you from learning another language either. You kind of project that into uh, other people's, you project that, I suppose, that fear. That'll stop you then. But that's that's the main thing there with the syntax semantics is that you need to acquire it, but you also need to implement it. It's the implementation part that so often is very important. So I touched on this briefly, being pulled in every which direction, something I struggle with. I could often find myself struggling in terms of I want a bit more order to what I'm doing. So recently, the odd times have been like, maybe for the next two weeks, I'm just focused on programming. But what I have tended to notice is that I'll do that maybe for two weeks or so, because I have in the back of my mind too, that like this is my career, I should be dedicating most of my time, if not all of it, to programming, to progress. But what I do find is after a few weeks, I kind of get a bit burnt out by it. And... I suppose the way I look at things too is that like programming for me is a way to improve my logical reasoning skills. And then philosophy, while it's philosophy, psychology, while it's, it, there's mental effort that goes into that. That for me connects me more with a, more with the transcendent nature of humans, of people. It gets me to think beyond my current thinking gets me to contemplate that, to fathom that, kind of gets me more in touch with, it gets me more out of my head, in certain ways, in other ways, it gets me in my head, which is kind of why I took a bit of a break for a while. And to be fair, it's probably similar with programming too, you can kind of get into flow states in programming, and then there's parts of it that are mentally taxing and draining to try and work out new things, understand new concepts. I suppose they're similar in that way, like there's concepts in psychology or philosophy that take a while to wrap your head around, especially if it's different language or different jargon than you're used to, and you're trying to understand where they're coming from based off of your own frame of references and understanding of the world. It's similar with, I suppose, with programming. And then the other thing this ties into, I think with polymath tendencies in general, it's an appreciation of three other variables here of the known knowns. So this is like in programming, I know that I can write a for loop, an if condition. So I know that I know that. Then there's known unknowns. So this is, for example, I know that functional programming exists. I know that I know a few functions that are functional programming based that I could implement but I don't understand the concept of functional programming. 
they don't understand why it exists independent from object-oriented programming. I haven't got a firm grasp on that, and I know that about myself right now. But I know that there'll come a point where I'll have time to dedicate to understanding that, understanding those distinctions. And the last thing, unknown unknowns, are the things that you don't even know you don't know about. So I can't give an example of that for me in the present right now, because it would defeat the purpose of an unknown unknown. But I can give an example of in the past. So for example, when I starting off as a beginner coding, I had no idea of the existence of design patterns. I didn't know what they were, didn't know why anybody would go about learning them. When as time progresses into my fourth year now, professionally, you naturally start to think about these things as if, you, for me, I've been working on an application over the past four years. And I suppose as working as a team, working with other people, are more experienced and smarter than you you start to think about things that are higher level conceptually so you're not as in the weeds as you were in year one so it's a, you're gradually thinking higher level and so somebody will start thinking about design patterns when they're thinking about the organization of their code in general and even thinking about in terms of the team how will the team organize a code Basically, it comes from even this question of, or this even worry, not a worry for this, this, this longing, I guess, to minimize the amount of headaches you have in the future in terms of how you organize your code, how it can scale, how the application scale in the future too. So there, there's an element of thinking about the future that as a beginner, you're just focused on getting through today, trying to understand something from today. I think the, as you progress in your career, as you think more higher level, there's more of a tendency to think about the future, plan for the future. And then the last thing I want to talk about here is just the, not the perceived norm. So from what I can see, if somebody hasn't got like a passion for learning, if they're not fascinated by things or wanting to venture into very different fields. I see that as like something that's helping you to understand the world better. Then I, 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 what, from what I can see, the default mode is to see learning as you're just acquiring knowledge to get a job, to earn a living. So it's, you get a job to live. Uh, you don't live for work. So it's work to live, not live to work. And I understand that. I like there's parts of me that are still like that. But but when when you approach learning from something that's inherently enjoyable, I feel like the work is kind of an extension of that. So I'm not saying that you're gonna well, possibly there are people who who find work that they enjoy, but I suppose there's always gonna be work to it. Like work Work is work. It's still work. Like it's work improving on something. So even though you enjoy improving, it's still work. So that's, well, that's something to to think about. It's um the way the way I would approach it is to follow my curiosities, what I enjoy learning about, and then allow that to line up with the marketplace in terms of how can I get a job where I can earn a decent living because that's part of, I feel like what will make you a better learner is, is like if you're constantly worrying about money or finances or you're constantly in between jobs, that takes up a lot of mental energy and space in your head that takes away from what you could be doing creatively and different projects or what you're learning or who you're interacting with. So there's a lot to be said about focusing, putting weight on financial stability so as you follow your different passions or different curiosities to just keep an eye on how that lines up with the marketplace. What's the best possible option here where I combine financial stability with something I enjoy doing with the realization that work is work as in to improve at something, you still need to work at it, even though it's enjoyable. That sense of improving is enjoyable. It's that sense of progress. Like programming, I feel like it's a, I feel personally it's a, it's a challenging, it can be a very challenging, difficult field. But then there's a lot of, I find a lot of joy in solving a problem I haven't solved before. 
are building something. There's there's joy inherent in that. It's like a sense of this has been difficult, but I stuck with it and I've something to show for it. I there's a sense of pride and achievement in that. So that's something there. So because following polymath tendencies is it's not the perceived norm from what I can see, it's not the default. But that's not that's not to say that there's not a lot of people like that in the world. But I feel like unless you come across somebody who's passionate about learning, the default ideas are more in line with stick to a specialization, stay in your own. That was the first podcast episode actually that I had in this stay in your lane. But it's stay in your own lane. Don't go outside of that because you're going to waste time and energy. And I, I guess in our society too, in the Western world, so much of what we learn and our drive to learn and acquire skills is linked monetarily. So there has to be a monetary value to what you're learning. That's that's a kind of a common mindset. I think that that's out there. And I think one of the opportunities following your polymath tendencies affords you is in an environment that r- shifts rapidly, shifts over the years, like look at what we're looking at now, ChatGPT, AI coming more into the mainstream in terms of work, then when you're exploring your polymath tendency, I think a lot of what you're doing is learning how to learn. And so it makes you more adaptable in the marketplace. So I'm looking at the marketplace today and I'm seeing AI being brought in. And what I hope, what I think will happen is it's like assistive tools that will, it won't replace programmers. It'll just help us to focus more and more on higher level things. That's the way I see society evolving the way ideally society evolves is that as we make progress it frees our minds up to focus on more higher level things whatever they may be i suppose they exist in the unknown unknowns but there's a constant evolution and that i feel is an antidote to the scaremongering that can kind of go on of you can look at ai coming into the forefront now and then fear that there's going to be your job is that it's going to be lost but if you've got a love of learning, you, you'll be looking at it and like, okay, it's, it's challenging, but at least I've a focus on acquiring the skills that will help me to shift industry if I have to. Because at the end of the day, I can't imagine a world where nobody works. And if there was such a world, maybe that's utopia where we're not working anymore. So that's just another slight kind of insight into it. I wouldn't, I'm, I guess I'm learning to not worry so much about the particular job and then focus on, focus on the learning how to learn. Like if you're focused on building your logical, critical thinking, and then you're focused on creatively expressing yourself. I think there are two large components to a person. So focus on the human things. Like if AI is coming along, Think about like what does AI not have right now that we possess as human beings, and focus more of your energy on cultivating that. I feel like that 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 can be a solid approach, but it's an amalgamation of a lot of different things. And at the end of the day, it's kind of learn to follow your gut and improve your logic at the same time. So you're learning to. There is an analogy for following your gut as as as, it's like a car. You're driving a car with the lights on in the dark and you only see five feet in front of you all the time. I don't know, could I extend that analogy? I have a thing in my mind for logic around you're building the road as you go along as well with your logic. So you're not only following this, you're not only being driven by a car because at the end of the day, like I feel like the gut's more akin to a car that you're sitting in that's driving you. But so you're, learning to to sit in the car, let it drive. But at the same time, you're building the road in front of you with your logic. So it's not, I think that kind of makes a bit of sense. 
even though I don't physically see how that makes sense that you can't be sitting in the car and, and building a road at the same time. But so it's not the perfect visual metaphor. But like I think your intuition, your gut can only guide you so far as your logical mind can let you follow. So for example, if your logical mind has started to enclose you in. So for example, if you're someone who will only believe in facts and will believe nothing outside of the realm of facts and logic, then that's a limited path. Your car can't put you, it can't, it can only keep you on motorways that have been created by other people. But if you can learn to trust your gut and intuition, then you could end up, obviously you'll be, you could end up going to a jungle as well, but you'll get off the beaten path a bit more. There'll be a bit, bit more living there. It's not all known, known roads you're going down then. There's a bit more adventure to it, a bit more of a life lived to it. So that's uh, something to keep in mind as well, if that made any bit of sense. So that's it. Thanks again for listening, and I will speak to you on the next episode.